these guys, I could probably just say go, and we would be fine. But I do have some organized questions for you, and if you want to deviate from them, feel free. And so you, they're, all three are experts on C.S. Lewis and really looking forward to what they have to say. I'm going to start with some low-hanging fruit. If you would just say your favorite Lewis book and why. Um, that is a very difficult question. Um, I won't give a political answer and say which books I like on Monday and which ones I like on Wednesday. I suppose my um, my favorite non-fiction book by C.S. Lewis is Miracles. I find it extraordinarily helpful and the mix of, of clear thinking and deep imagination is, is very evident in it. And in fiction, uh, my I think my favorite is Perilandra, the second in the science fiction trilogy. I think my favorite will always be surprised by joy because it was instrumental in pointing me to Christ in my conversion. But if I, to go to the old idea of if you were on an island and could only have one C.S. Lewis book, what would you have? I'd probably get Walter Hooper's edition of God in the Dock because there are so many great short pieces in there. Nonfiction, Surprised by Joy, because I think he understands, because it's a story about his own conversion especially, and he understands that people aren't motivated by logic, but that logic is necessary, you know, it's in, in its proper place. But discussing the true motivation of somebody who moves, what moves a person truly, moves them. And it's hearing the story earlier about how it moved you is was terrific. So I like it even more now. Uh, and then that hideous strength as a novel. I, just, I think it's just a magnificent novel. I love Paralandra too, but it's uh, it's fantabulous to use a phrase, a, a word coined by Charles Williams. <laughs> Did Charles Williams coin that? Okay, just making sure. There's some inkling trivia there that would be good to know. Well, I'm going to ask a few questions directed at individuals, but feel free, please jump in. And I'd like to start with you. In your C.S. Lewis encyclopedia, you make the statement that C.S. Lewis is an enigmatic figure. And you give something of a warning of trying to interpret Lewis from our own situation in life. Can you unpack that a little bit, Colin? Well, since um, I wrote the C.S. Lewis encyclopedia, which was about 14 years ago, I've actually done a new edition now called The A to Z of Lewis, which is uh, bigger. And I'm still, uh, I still think that Lewis is an enigmatic character. I think it's because he's, there's so many sides to him. You know, preeminently he was a scholar and a storyteller. He was, um, you know, he's called Jack. He's, I, I think of him as a jack of two trades, really. But he was also lots of other things he could write for children. Um, he, could, he could write deep philosophy. In fact, when he was young, he was part of a group of young philosophers in, in Oxford that used to meet informally. Um, so there's depth upon depth there, and um, it, I'm sure it's to do with the way that, um, that God worked in his life. And um, so the truth is I haven't got to the bottom of the enigma of C.S. Lewis. I just find his writings and his uh, person um, constantly fascinating, and that's why I keep writing about him. So. Uh, um, but I think the, the idea of the encyclopedia was that it gave you a way in, you could go in from you know, wh whichever entry you wanted um, to find out more about him, whether you went in through one of his non-fiction books like Mere Christianity or through a Narnian story um, or through one of the science fiction stories. It would still come to the same person, but a different facet unfolded. Or even reading um, the Oxford English history of... Um, of literature, the um, um, English literature in the 16th century, excluding drama, which got Lewis off having to write about um, Shakespeare. <laughs> well, and you gave the warning there, and uh, unfortunately, I don't have the newer edition, so I'll have to get that. I have the older one, and you give the warning that people try to interpret Lewis. Would would you, and if you guys want to chime in on this, what would be a danger for even attendees at a conference like this? to kind of bring, try and bring C.S. Lewis to our setting instead of understanding him in his own time? Yes, I think we have to be very careful of that because people like to create Lewis in their own image. And, um, but I think the, the antidote to that is to make sure that, um, 
that you read Lewis widely, you know, once you start to get hooked on his thought and writings, make sure that um, you're not just reading one of his types of books, but, you know, if you're an adult, you've never read the Narnian stories, well, do read them and uh, enjoy them. Um, and and uh, similarly, if, um, if you've only read fiction, try, try reading Mere Christianity or Miracles or, 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 or his letters. His letters are absolutely wonderful. And they're now available in three massive volumes. And if, you're, if your wrist starts to ache, you can get them on Kindle and carry them around like that, as I do. Lyle, in, in your writing, in all of your books, I mentioned earlier that your biography of joy really is one of the ones I'm the most thankful for. What led you to, to begin there in your Lewis scholarship with joy? To be very honest with you, I started that book the book was originally published in 1983. The idea for the book came one night in late 1980. I had never written one line on C.S. Lewis. I'd been influenced by Lewis's writings. They'd helped me become a Christian. And I'd been a Christian four years. But I really, uh, I really wanted to I'd been praying, Lord, help me write a book that might further the kingdom. I'd been writing secular history, nothing wrong with that. I think it's important. But I wanted to write something else. And my wife had bought me at a remainder table a copy of Smoke on the Mountain, a hardback first edition. Helen Joy Davidman, Lewis's wife, was a Jewish woman who wrote, the first book she ever wrote was entitled Smoke on the Mountain, and it's a Jewish interpretation of the Ten Commandments for the 20th century. I pulled that book off the shelf. I started reading it, and I was absolutely taken by the book. And I thought, man, this woman, her name rings a bell. But at the time she wrote that book, this first edition, she had no relationship with Lewis. So I went and pulled off the Hooper Green biography of Lewis, and sure enough, she was the one that married C.S. Lewis, but they devoted about two paragraphs to her. It was like they wanted to hide her. I decided that night, I want to know who this woman is. And I woke, the next morning I told my wife, I think I'm going to write her biography. I really feel stirred by the Lord to do it. And she said, well, if he's in it, you'll do it. Well, that's a long answer to a story, but it was, to me, it was a nudging from God. I did it, and because of that book, I got into the world of C.S. Lewis that otherwise I really have no right to. I don't know as much as Colin does about Lewis, but I, I love him and his stuff. Is, I can't wait to meet him and thank him for what he's done. Absolutely. What was your most surprising discovery from her life? My most surprising discovery in getting into her life was how abrasive she was <laughs> and how tedious it must have been to be around her. And as I began to gather materials and interview people that knew her, I even said to my wife, I said, Mary, I'm not sure I want to write this woman's biography because she's not that pretty in a lot of ways. And Mary said, what kind of people do you think God has to work with? Uh, you know, we need books that aren't a bunch of hagiographical studies that yeah. airbrush every flaw. Yeah. So I wrote the story, and uh, it became a movie, Shadowlands, and it, it opened a lot of doors for me to witness for Christ, especially among Jewish people. Um, Alistair McGrath's biography and his treatment of, of joy. How Do you have any thoughts, comment, commentary on that? Do you feel like that lines up pretty well? I think Alistair McGrath's new biography of Lewis is a first-rate effort. It's got some really sharp and keen insights into things that we haven't seen before. He's got superb material on World War I and Lewis and the war. I'm very disappointed in the way he dealt with Joy Davidman. Uh, I don't want to knock in. You know, people got to write the book they got to write, but it's in one way it's as he does not show us the profound impact she had on C.S. Lewis. In fact, the, the book Surprised by Joy really has two meanings to it. He was surprised by Joy David. He's surprised by Sainzu's longing joy, but he's also surprised by Joy David. And everybody that knew him knew that. She was a, 
I, I think she she was so important to Lewis at a variety of levels that do not come through in that book. Well, that's helpful because you have the, the Shadowlands, the movie kind of version of Joy, and now we have a, another a polar opposite, and so that's... But and that does, it doesn't bother me that because the movie really distorts Joy uh -huh. and the boys and Jack and everything, but it's just there's so much more of Joy that I think could have... But everybody's got to write the book. They, I'm glad he's not here to put, to tell me what he thinks of my biography of Joy. <laughs> in, in Louisville, Kentucky, Douglas Gresham just spoke this last week with Devin Brown, who's just published a book on Lewis. And what surprised me, him talking about uh, Warney, and he said Warney's grieving over Joy's passing was extremely significant. And I really, I had never thought about Warney's relationship with Joy. She loved Warney like a brother, and he loved her like a sister. And Warney could be hard to love at times. He wrestled with alcoholism, he made a lot of mistakes, but she, she knew what it was to be a sinner saved by grace. And she loved him, and she was committed to him. Well, Andy, I've got a question for you. I know you have a great deal of interest in The Great Divorce, beyond it as a literary work of Lewis and your appreciation of it. And, and I watched a, a video with you, I think it was you and your dad and maybe Alan Jacobs. And at some point a comparison was made between Rob Bell and Love Wins and The Great Divorce. Could we find Rob Bell perhaps in The Great Divorce? Would, would Lewis have sympathized with Love Wins? Oh man, you're really setting me up here, aren't you? Um, yeah, well, I think we do find Rob Bell in The Great Divorce. I think there's, there's actually a religious character uh, grappling and wrestling with issues when the answer is right there and who, who ref it's about the wrestle it's about the the discussion the con and this, I, I don't know Rob personally so I can't you know I can't speak to his heart but I can sp I can speak to the effect of what he's done uh, in, in a lot of his books and also a lot of people I know who are reflections of it I went through philosophy clubs you know I was that kind of person who hated philosophy but I really loved hating it. And so I was in philosophy clubs and reading Kant and all that kind of stuff. And I knew a lot of people who were stuck in the perpetual wrestle and they couldn't stop when the answer finally came. And the, the, the journey is great, but the journey has to go to a place and it has to stop. There has to be a point of rest. And so the, the Chesterton quote, you know, he's his, to just dovetail him in here to a Lewis discussion. Uh, that an open mind serves the same purpose as an open mouth. It's meant to close on something. Like you have to actually, it needs to close. And I, I think that Lewis does actually have religious uh, seekers who refuse to see heaven and embrace heaven and grace, even when they're there because they're still stuck in the wrestle and the discussion. I think it's, well, Lewis is intensely perceptive into people's motivations what makes humans do what humans do, what makes us hold on to our weaknesses and cherish them. And I think The Great Divorce is, is one of the best examples of that, where you did, obviously in Screwtape and in his other novels, but Great Divorce is just person by person, different discussions, different characters, different insecurities, and it always comes down to serving oneself or forgetting oneself, laying oneself down or pursuing the self. On the one hand, heaven, on the one hand, Hell. The use of George MacDonald. Yeah. What, what do you think the significance? <laughs> what are we to make of that? Because I, I teach a class at Southern Seminary on Lewis, right, yeah. and I divide my class into the right side and the left side, and we argue. You know, the right side argues a right, you know, a conservative Lewis, and the left side argues kind of a less conservative sure. Lewis. And you know, they'll go get the George MacDonald anthology and quote from that. Look, Lewis is a universalist, and, and I have to remind them those aren't his words. You know, yeah. he's quoting McDonald, but he places him in the story. Why is that? I, I think it's gentle ribbing. I think he's razzing uh, a mentor of his that he didn't know, but that was instrumental in his own salvation. And he loves McDonald. And I think inserting McDonald into a situation where a bunch of people are coming from hell up to the, the edge of heaven and are getting back on the bus and going back to hell is just a direct disagreement with McDonald. Yeah. 
And McDonald and the Great Divorce is, is uh, obviously not historical McDonald. It's Lewis as Lewis imagines McDonald to be now that he's wiser and on the other side. But it's clear, I mean, most of the people, you see some conversion, some conversion occurs in the Great Divorce, but the overwhelming majority of the people we see hang on to their vice, hang on to their little petty thing, and hop back up on the, you know, on the bus and go back down to Greytown. And once there, there's, there's a lot of little details in the Great Divorce that are fun to unpack, but when you're down in Greytown, there's some people that are just ghosts, and some people are really shriveled up, really shriveled up hard little monsters. And the first thing that happens when everybody goes up into the light of heaven, into the light of grace, is that they all shrivel up. When they take the bus trip up, they all shrivel in that presence, in that light. And then we discover the origin of all those shriveled ones down in Greytown. They're the ones who've actually been to heaven and seen grace and still turned their backs on it and gone back down. And for McDonald to be there and to, for, the, for those people to be there, I think is just a clear comment, a point of disagreement. Uh, with McDonald, even though he loved him, and I, I admire McDonald a lot as well. So we've mentioned George McDonald and Rob Bell and C.S. Lewis in this short conversation. Chesterton, we got in Chesterton. And Chesterton, we got in Chesterton. And Joy Davidman. That's right. Where do we place C.S. Lewis in the evan evangelical scale? Where do we put him? Where does he fit? <laughs> early church. Yeah, early church. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> so I think it's, a, it's a, almost like a false category to try and fit Lewis into what we understand as evangelicalism. I mean, I think this conference is great because you're bringing together two worlds, really. You know, this is an evangelical group of people, and you're bringing Lewis into it. But it's, uh, you have to acknowledge that um, he's, he's very unusual. He doesn't really um, fit easily into our categories. He belongs to an older world, you know. I just gave a little talk about whether Lewis was a, a dinosaur or a revolutionary, you know. Um, but he's representing an old world, but, um, but making that older world accessible to a modern world so that we've got a wider perspective on the world in which we live. And if we're just imposing um, our understanding of um, evangelicalism onto him, we're missing a lot of things. Um, I mean, it would be nice if he agreed with us on every point. But I, as from, from my point of view, I, 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 I've never found that being steeped in Lewis has weakened my, my belief, say, in the inerrancy of Scripture. It's just helped me to read the Bible in a better way, you know, um, to try and to appreciate the fact that there's, there's hugely imaginative stuff in the Bible that you, you, you miss if you just look at it through a, a simple a conceptual framework. Uh, and so... Lewis has enormously enriched my reading of scripture without at all weakening my view of it. I don't know if that fits in with anybody else. I, I think, first of all, if you look at Lewis on a spectrum of, the, of Anglicanism, he's fairly squarely in the middle because you've got very evangelical, lower church Anglican, and then you've got very high church, even to the extent almost Anglo-Catholics. And Lewis is pretty much in the middle of that. And you can see that in, he has a very high view of scripture. He has a very high view of the efficacy of prayer. On the other hand, he has a very high view of the sacraments and felt that people ought to get communion at least once a week and even more often if you could. He often had it twice a week, um, which is this, he doesn't fit neatly because he wasn't attempting to follow some systematic theology. His theology is very eclectic. He is, he was a student of early church fathers. He's a student of the reformers, but he's influenced by Luther. He's influenced by Calvin. He's influenced by Wesley. He read all of these people and he refuses to follow Calvin or follow Wesley. He would be appalled if we followed Lewis. He would want us, I mean, the man studied the scriptures on his own. He was as good an exegete as anybody out of the best divinity schools in the English speaking world. He didn't go to divinity school, but he knew Koine Greek. And he kept his Greek alive. He and Owen Barfield corresponded in Greek just to keep the language alive. Uh, but the point is, he came to the conclusions he felt he must, and he got very disturbed about people. He, he wrote in, 
extremely interesting letter to a Roman Catholic man. <coughs> and the Catholic had, in essence, asked him, why aren't you Catholic? And well, Lewis, among other things, he wasn't a transubstantiationist, and he, so he wasn't going to go that route. But he did talk about what I like to do is try to find the areas where we can agree and get along. And then he said this. It was a very interesting statement. He said, I get far less criticism for my books from you people, the Catholics, or even from secular people and atheists than I get from these Puritans. He did not like Puritans. And his reason was this. He said that they were so separatistic and fundamentalist about things that if you didn't agree with them, they felt a need to dash off a hot letter and tell you where you were wrong. And he found that very tiresome. He also found it hypocritical. And I don't know what you all think, and, or what I think isn't, if I'm trying to tell you what Lewis thought about these things. He said, for example, he said, I get criticized that I have a spiritual director. He said, when they, people say, you can go directly to the Lord. He said, but for the Puritans, their favorite book next to the Bible is Pilgrim's Progress. And he said, there are two women in that book that get chewed out because they didn't have a proper conductor to get them to the celestial city. So he said, let's get off of the hypocrisy, find out where we can get along together. We got an enemy bigger than our differences. Let's keep moving. Sorry about the sermon. It was a good one. It was a, it was a nice sermon. Uh, I, I honestly think that placing Lewis is difficult and kind of impossible because of how much he's influenced people. So how do, like, there's, there's so much avalanche in thinking, in Christian thinking, Christian imagination after him. Trying to locate him in it is weird because he's up at the headwaters. Um, and then as a side note, also, when you try to place somebody as if they were the same thing every moment of their life. It's, it's also impossible. So Lewis's early thoughts on scripture were very different from his late thoughts on scripture. His early thoughts on evolution versus his thoughts at the end of his life. He's, like, like all of us, he was growing and learning and in motion. And so he got along with Tolkien. Tolkien was his best friend. But then Tolkien also thought that he became so staunchly Protestant at the end of his life that they, they grew apart, you know, the friendship uh, lessened. So just like looking at the canon of Lewis, it's, it'd be, I mean, I, I think that all of us stand with Lewis uh, in a lot of ways, but only because he's our teacher, like he's taught us so much. So in some ways he's, he's able to stand next to a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Can I make one point about, this is really important what you're saying. He, he grows, he changes. <laughs> well said, my man, he's buying my dinner. Um, but no, the, the point is, Lewis did change on things, but there's another factor. I mean, for example, he used, Warren, he said, his brother Warren said, Jack used to think if he had communion once a month, it was plenty. Well, by the late 1950s, he's telling people, get communion as often as you can get it. He had totally switched his view. But the other thing is that, and even going back to what we said about George MacDonald, Lewis is often accused of being a universalist because MacDonald said God would never give up on his people. But Lewis never said that. And there is that little episode at the end of the last battle and people say, oh, there's Lewis, everybody's saved, all the roads. Lewis made it very clear that the Narnian Chronicles were not analogies. Aslan is not Jesus. The White Witch is not Satan. These are stories about longing, about spiritual quests, and it's really unfair to Lewis to take one of his books where you've got a fictional character and say, ah, we've caught him on some heresy here, because that he's telling a story. He wasn't setting out to write the Christ story as Narnia. That was not what he did. It, it comes through and it draws us to the Lord, but he had a totally different ambition. To, to pile in there at the end, and what, what you said earlier about him disliking Puritans, I know just from personal experience, I get more complaints and more people upset from people who should be closer to me. Yeah. You know, it, it's, just, it's just an odd thing. And I still can't get my head around Christians who don't like magic or, you know, it just doesn't make, it doesn't make sense to me. And it is also really funny that people with, where I have more differences, it's easy, easy interaction, letters, reviews, and so on, versus people who want to pick 
very particular nits. And so I personally have had letters from people upset that I would promote the Narnia Chronicles because you know, the doctrine of the atonement or the stone table is inaccurate. It's like, but it's not the cross and it's not Christ. It's, it's about redemption. It's about, it's about repentance. It's about self-sacrifice. And he, he was not looking for a pilgrim's progress allegorical structure. That's not what he was trying to do. Well, related to that, Lewis speaking into areas of theology, directly or indirectly. I was, we have a coffee shop on campus, as you might imagine, and I was sitting behind one of our um, apologetics professors, Mark Coppinger, and uh, I asked Mark, um, somehow, we turned to who, the question, who was the most influential theologian of the 20th century? And without hesitation, he said C.S. Lewis. But C.S. Lewis never claimed to be. He, in fact, he always reminded us he wasn't a theologian. What are we to make of that? A man who constantly reminded us he's not a theologian, but considered by many probably to be the greatest theologian of the 20th century. Well, perhaps that's the answer that it's um, that we could we can see his quality as a theologian, even though he didn't claim to be it. Why, why the effect has had on our lives and on the lives of so many people? I find it mind-boggling the way that Lewis book, Lewis's books are received throughout the world. You know, many different cultures and um, I mean in Japan for example which has a long history of opposition to Christianity his books are published they um, my little guide to Narnia um, I, I received through the post this beautiful Japanese edition of it you know and I just thought it's amazing that um, that in Japan there's a place in bookshops and in libraries for my my little guide to to Lewis's books and the books are obviously translated uh, into Japanese and you know that's pretty staggering and uh, so um, I think that's the way to look at it, that's, uh, that we can see in Lewis something which enriches our theological understanding, even though he didn't claim it. The irony is that Tolkien was extremely irritated by Lewis's um, lay theology. He thought Lewis was totally out of place to be giving the BBC wartime broadcast on mere Christi what we know as mere Christianity now. He thought that it should be left to the experts, the people, you know, the, the priests, the people who'd been trained to you know, in theology, so that they'd had a careful training of the biblical languages and everything, so that they would speak accurately about the doctrines. Owen Barfield, who was Lewis's good friend and his lawyer, among other things, told me when my wife and I were doing an oral history interview with him, I told him, I said, is it true that Tolkien was embarrassed and upset that the screw tape letters were dedicated to him? And Barfield's response was, well, of course he was. I would have been, too. And I said, well, that shocks me. I would have been so honored. He said, well, he said, Jack is neither, he's, he was neither trained as a theologian nor ordained in the church. He said he had no business writing on those subjects. And he said, however, his response to that was, until the theologians and the clergy can communicate basic doctrine to ordinary people, I'm going to have to do it. So when you guys get the job done, I won't have to do it. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's the most influential, because he speaks to those of us who are not a bunch of specialists writing for 500 people in our field. You know, right? I'd, say, I'd say 50 people. 50. But it's, it's also, with, with Lewis, you have, that, I think that's what made him an evangelical. Like, if you want to know what is the most evangelical aspect of Lewis, it's his John the Baptist willingness to go around and prepare the way without a pedigree, without asking permission, without having been trained. Amen. You know, it's just like that's, that was an extremely evangelical impulse that he had and, and has blessed not just thousands of people, but actually millions of people that he would do those radio broadcasts that became mere Christianity. So, you know, every, everything he did where he walked around untidily messing people's hair up who were experts uh, and then ex except for English literature in the 16th century ex excluding drama uh, everything else is just without permission he just did it without permission I think we have to remember that about the kind of God that, uh, that, that we know that God is unexpected he works in in ways that get that um, uh, sometimes appear to be very foolish I mean the, the crucifixion itself has been described as the devil's mousetrap because it was so unexpected that that would uh, be the way of um, saving the world and uh, and and it's part of um, the way that God worked that He's chosen somebody like C.S. Lewis to uh, 
to, to speak to the modern world. We've often, as evangelicals, we've neglected to communicate to the world in which we live. We, we get into safe subcultures. I mean, it may not be so, so much in America, but certainly in the UK, the, um, there's a great divorce between, um, between the general culture and, and the Christian culture, which is very, very sad. And um, not, not entirely, because in the academic world, there's been a lot of people that have, uh, Christians who have worked very hard in, um, in the academic world, um, in, in, in secular universities to, to have a Christian presence. If I could take this issue maybe from the other side. So we've talked about sometimes Lewis will leave things messy. He'll get in an area and, and kind of mess up our theology. And drive Tolkien nuts. Yeah. yeah. And so, but could someone say, you know, that was a bit of a cop out to start all these letters with, I'm not really a theologian. I'm going to say this, but I'm not a theologian. So I always have this back door. What, would such a criticism have any bearing at all? Would it be warranted at all? No. I think absolutely not. And it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's really silly how specialized we've made education and training because theologians, would we make them write something at the beginning that said, I have not been trained in stories. I unfortunately have not studied narrative. It's like, no, we don't. Either they can do it or they can't. And, it's, and that's it. And when you have people who are really broad, incredibly educated, very, very well read, and then have kind of the pastoral sensibility and insight into humans individually that Lewis did, that Tolkien showed glimmers of, but didn't have the same depth of insight, I don't think. Like, I've, I think it's fine that he said that. I think he said that to placate his friends who were more tidy minded. But you have to remember that he was best buds with somebody who would obsess over the cycles of the moon in Middle Earth and not release a manuscript until he had the moon right. And you know, thousands of people waiting in frustration for the book to come out while he's getting the loon the lunar cycles correct in Rohan. Like, really? Like and then Lewis would just hand write Voyage of the Dawn Treader and send it off. And so I think I think no, it's it's skill and ability and insight is his is his authority there. Truth is his authority. And if he hadn't had the insight, it wouldn't have lasted, it wouldn't have mattered, it would have just faded. I think he was genuinely humble too. And I think he started some of those letters by saying, you know, I'm really not an authority here. However, I'm going to tell you what I think. Mm -hmm. And he could take a strong stand. There was one woman that wrote to him a series of letters and said, you know, well, my pastor tells me he doesn't believe Jesus, that, that, vir that Mary was a virgin. And he has several arguments for that. And Lewis wrote back to her very simply. He said, then he would be wrong. <laughs> Well, related to Tolkien, since we went there a bit, you've written quite a bit about Tolkien, perhaps more about Tolkien than Lewis. I, I'm, I didn't count them. Oh, um, did you? Oh, well, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize. <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit about their friendship and the uniqueness of their friendship, and if you want to expand it to the Inklings, you've written books about the Inklings as well. Well, sometimes I say, um, when I'm talking about the friendship, I say, imagine a world without Lord of the Rings or imagine a world without the Chronicles of Narnia. And that's what the world would be like if it wasn't for the friendship between Lewis and Tolkien. It was, it was that important. And um, um, in my book on the friendship, um, the gift of friendship, uh, I try and spell that out about why they were so important to each other. And just earlier I spoke on that subject and somebody said to me after, they didn't realize how much, you know, how important the friendship was. And, um, and I think that the friendship between Lewis and Tolkien was very much at the core of um, of the Inklings. I mean, there's a lot of mystery about how the Inklings evolved because we have very little documentation. And uh, part of the fun is to dig out um, letters and scraps of information here and there and try and build up a picture. And um, you know you're going to tread on a few people's corns when you do it because people have various theories about when they began, what the Inklings were like and who were members and who weren't. Um, and if you say it started in a certain year, they'll say, oh, but it might have been a later year. How do you know? <laughs> um, but um, one thing I've come to realize recently is that the beginning of the Inklings was very much tied into Lewis's conversion um, because he often made a point of describing the Inklings in the early years as being made up of people who were Christians and had, an inkling, uh, had a desire to write. So those were the two characteristics. 
Now, Lewis points out somewhere that um, you can't be too precious over the use of the word Christian. Um, you know, we like to only call people Christians if they're, um, you know, subscribed to the 39 Articles or, um, or the Five Principles of Calvinism or something like that. But it's also, but it's got a wider usefulness than that. So that, um, so in the case of Lewis and Tolkien, you could describe them both as, as um, Christians, though Lewis had the Puritan background and Tolkien had the Roman Catholic background. Um, but that seemed to be very much at the heart of what the Inklings were, and also that they were something of uh, an oasis in a world they regarded as hostile, in that the modern world was, in Lewis's words, post-Christian. But it allowed them to gain strength and encouragement to actually address the world that they were in, even though they seemed like reactionaries. I mean, Lewis hardly ever read newspapers, for example. How on earth could somebody who never read newspapers address the modern world in a relevant way, you know. How can you wrap your brain around that? And, but somehow, um, Lewis and his friends were in touch with the, the deeper currents of what was happening um, in our world as it changed, as it changed into the, the world that we know today. Tolkien didn't approve of joy, did he? Tolkien did not like joy. I think in part because he did he was appalled that Lewis would marry a divorced woman. Tolkien is very Catholic, and he was puzzled by Lewis. Uh, he, wouldn't under, he couldn't understand why Lewis wouldn't become a Catholic. In fact, he even wrote a letter to his son, Tolkien did, said, I just don't understand Jack. He loves Holy Communion, and he speaks highly of nuns, but he won't have anything, you know, he won't. Well, he was an Ulster man, among other things, and he had some great doctrinal differences with the Catholics. But Tolkien did not like Joy Davidman because she was abrasive. He didn't like her because she was Jewish. He didn't like her because she was an American. She was divorced, she barged into Lewis's life. He was a confirmed bachelor and people had strong opinions about her. Uh, I was shocked when I went to work on that biography about how much anti-Semitism I encountered in England when I did interviews with people. I was shocked by the virulent anti-Semitism. There were people that just loathed her because she was a Jewess, as they said. And it, it just I, it left me reeling. One time at Wheaton, I, a woman, two Anglican nuns came in to the Wade Center there and there was a picture of C.S. Lewis's wife, Joy Davidman, on a table there, and I was standing off to the side, and one of them looked at the other and said, oh, there's that Jewess that Lewis married, and spit the word out. And I said, yes, she was Jewish, but we worship a Jewish carpenter too, don't we? And uh, they didn't see a lot of humor in that, but it <laughs> wasn't intended to be real humorous. <laughs> I think that uh, I think Tolkien didn't care for her because she was abrasive, and that was his job. You know, it's like he was threatened. He he was th that staunch curmudgeon, sandpapery, tough guy to deal with and be around. And honestly, it was probably preparation for Jack to be able to be with Joy. So it's really it really is kind of funny. You can only have two real curmudgeons. Uh, you know, like can, can they? coexist I don't think they they really could very just well enough room for one yeah just yeah. there's one and that's it but it's Tolkien was the friendship was absolutely key because they challenged each other and criticism I think one of the greatest gifts that God gave to Lewis was Tolkien and Tolkien the curmudgeon Tolkien the harsh critic because Lewis would have slapped things out there and just you know happily and like generated pulp novel after pulp novel and thrown it out there and it would have been good stuff but Tolkien's one who made him go back to it and complained about it and his work improved so it never necessarily got up to the level that Tolkien wanted it to you know he might still have petty problems with something but Lewis's work improved under that kind of criticism if you have to build a building that's going to stand up in a windstorm it's going to be a stronger building and given that he had to go down to the pub and read it out loud to Tolkien it was, a, it was stronger work. Like he had to go resist this tough critic whom he loved and respected. 
And I think that's absolutely essential for any creator is to have strong criticism, you know, strong criticism that comes with affection, you know, with affection there. I think that's, I think Tolkien can take credit for a huge amount of the quality of Lewis's work. Now, did Lewis have the reverse effect? Did he speed Tolkien up at all? He was well, just a super fan. Okay. I was just going to say that um, some other of Lewis's friends were important in the way that he wrote. Um, I think Ian Wilson points out that um, Lewis's friendship with Arthur, Arthur Greaves, his holster friend from teenage years, was very important in uh, Lewis developing an ability to write for um, non non intellectual people. I mean, uh, there's nothing wrong with the with, with Arthur's intelligence, but he wasn't an academic. Lewis appreciated him through his ability to feel and so on, but. His, his correspondence with Arthur is absolutely enormous. If you look at the, the three massive volumes of Lewis's correspondence that are in print, a lot of those letters are to Arthur. And that constant writing to him, a sharing, was, was very, very important. And without it, you know, we wouldn't have perhaps a lot of Lewis's um, books that we love so much. So it's a very con the pattern of friendship around Lewis was very complex. I was just going to say, I love the letter. It's so moving. C.S. Lewis's last letter to Arthur Greaves where he comes to grips with, he won't see him again. Mm. So, um, I want to ask a couple more questions to keep us on track. Did you want to add something? Uh, I just wanted to say one thing about the Lewis-Tolkien relationship. You read The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, there's a massive theme in there of longing, mm. what Lewis calls joy. And those men shared a, just a, just a heartbeat for longing, and it's in both of the men's yeah. writings. I think it's a point yeah. of connection there yeah. that yeah. You know, it's like, hey, we're in the same fraternity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. We could go on talking for a long time. I would certainly enjoy it, but for the for sake of time, I want to ask two more questions. One, I'm just going to throw out there for anyone to respond to. And then my final question off every everybody uh, make sure everyone responds. While in your um, recent Christianity Today work on Lewis. You end, I believe, your chapter in there saying his letters and books and the lives these writings touch are his legacy. What's the future of Lewis's legacy? Just for anyone to think about, respond to. I think his legacy will, I said this at a seminar earlier this afternoon, that I believe his letters especially his letters of spiritual counsel are going to live on and on and on because they're, they are profound and they flow out of a man who was really deeply committed to the great physician. The great physician spoke through those letters, pu pushed Lewis to do them because Lewis didn't want to write all those letters. But he did it out of obedience because he felt the Lord told him to answer all his fan mail. I, I think to, to pile on, I honestly believe that school kids, Christian school kids, centuries from now will be saying, so Lewis and Augustine, like, do they live at the same time? Or like, what's... Like that, that kind of like muddling and confusion. I think what Lewis has done is lasting. I think it's going to last. I think he's going to be more read in 50 years than he is now. And I think he's going to be around. And then if you think about history of the world, like on into the future, give it a thousand years and, and Augustine and, and Calvin and Lewis and Chesterton, like these, these great ones who've really expressed it well and beautifully and touched lives. You know, I, I think they'll just be all a blur for us as early church fathers. It's all back there. Yes, there was a point when Lewis thought that he was a failed writer, that um, you know, uh, his book sales were going down and he couldn't see any future for the books. And, uh, and then after that, they took off. And since his death, sales have, have, uh, have continued to rise and, and, and his uh, books are, are translated throughout the world. Um, it's very difficult to predict what it's going to be like in 50 years' time. But I think the idea that the Narnian stories were are not well written and so on, I think that's a myth that's, that's being exploded. And Michael Ward's work, for example, on Planet Narnia helps to, to show the, the, the quality of Lewis's sub-creation, to use Tolkien's phrase, in the way that he constructed uh, the stories. And, um, and 
in a way, you, if you can compare the books with the, say, the recent Narnian films, um, the books are much stronger. They're much more long-living than films. So some people have been very disappointed with um, at least some of the, uh, the of the three films that have come out. And um, but um, but the books are translated into many many languages. Even Turkish. I, um, I was a student in Turkey many years ago, and I, I just longed for the day when when the Narnian stories might be translated into Turkish. Aslan is Turkish for lion. And recently I asked a friend of mine, what have they done with the translation, Turkish translation? How have they translated Aslan? Have they, have they put the English word lion instead of Aslan? They said, oh no, they've just left it as Aslan. <laughs> so, but I think in 50 years' time, whatever books of Lewis's are still available, I, I, I think that the, um, the, the Narnian stories will be in the lead. You mentioned Michael Ward. We uh, this took our students to the kilns, and Michael came over and gave a talk. And it's so convincing and so compelling. And uh, I, I wish we had time, more time to talk about that. But it was fascinating to hear from him. The last question I want to leave you with, and uh, is this: your favorite quote or passage in the Lewis writings. And if if someone, you know, you're someone you love and you're expressing to them your love for Lewis and you want to make it as concise as a quote or one passage in Lewis's writing, what would it be? I'll, I'll pile on. Uh, two, actually, but one, I can't do it verbatim. But uh, Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Prince Caspian, says, oh, you come from one of those round worlds. Like just mm -hmm. come from like a ball world, you know. I've I've always want like always wanted to be on a round world, and I think that that right there encapsulates everything Lewis wanted to say to kids about the magic of their own world, the magic of here, and you know, and your life. And I I love that like having a fantasy character, yearning yearning like we yearned to go to Narnia, yearning to see you know yeah. to see this world and England, and then the other one was the description of a, a star as a, a, a ball, a, a burning ball of gas, and the correction being, no, that's just, even in our world, that's only what it's made of. That's not what it is, which is like another deep insight. It's like calling us bags of water. You know, there's so much more to it than that. Those are the two for me. I would say it's one of the, if not the last letter C.S. Lewis wrote, it's one of the very last, and he was a very sick man. And he wrote a letter to a little girl in America and he told her, keep your eyes on Jesus, follow him, obey him, and nothing else ever fundamentally can go wrong. One of the quotes who stays with me, I can't quote the whole passage, but it's related to the link between the longing, which he calls joy, the, the um, inconsolable longing, where he talks about um, joy being the the secret signature of each um, soul. Um, I think that that is, is one of the great uh, passages. Another one is when he um, he describes the way that um, we've we've disenchanted the world through um, what he calls the abolition of of humanity, um, the way we've stripped away qualities from um, from human beings. We, first of all, we. We, we stripped it from nature and then we turned to stripping these qualities from human beings. So we're left with human beings being absolutely nothing. And I, that's such a powerful passage. The acuteness of Lewis's thinking is there, plus the, the depth of his imagination. My favorite, if I could add to it, my favorite quote from Lewis is the, the final line from his essay is Theology Poetry. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but by it, I mm -hmm. see everything else. Mm -hmm. And C.S. Lewis has been so helpful in helping me see it and everything else through the power of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Thank you, men, for your time. Let's thank our panel.